Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Trelawney. I'm the Acting Director of the Technical Cooperation Division, IMO, and I have the great privilege and honor to be your moderator today. Uh, we have a busy program ahead of us, uh, a number of very distinguished and very competent speakers, so you'll be delighted to know I'll say as little as possible. Uh, before we start, a couple of housekeeping uh, rules. We will, uh, people, people's microphones will, will not uh, be used until uh, particular speakers are, are authorized to speak, so, so please don't worry about that. Uh, if you do have if any of the panelists want to say anything, please use the raise hand function uh, to uh, draw attention. Uh, we would encourage during this session for you to use the Q&A function uh, to write your questions. Uh, those that the panelists can handle today will be dealt with. Otherwise, we'll certainly look at them and uh, use them in future guidance material. I would also stress that this is the start of a process. This is a second of the regional uh, webinars that IMO Technical Cooperation Division is uh, doing globally. Uh, the intention really is to inform the debate draw attention to the issue of the challenges faced by seafarers and above all to identify best practices. What I'm going to be asking the speakers to do today is to identify what works. How can we get a better joined up approach to treating seafarers as key workers, facilitating their return home, facilitating seafarers to ships and generally increasing their uh, quality of life during this uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, so that's basically it. I will be uh, the, sorry, the biographies of the speakers, most of them should be well known to you. Uh, they are available uh, on the website given www.imo.org and we will put the, the link out on that. So enough from me uh, and we'll start off with some messages from the Secretary General. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected all of us with unprecedented impact on our lives, our economies, and our societies. Yet the global supply chain has kept on turning with the shipping, delivering medical supplies, food, fuel, and so many other goods needed in our daily lives. This is a thanks to more than 1 million seafarers on board world merchant ships. Their dedication and professionalism in the face of mounting challenges is worthy of our great admiration and gratitude. Every day we are receiving messages from physically and mentally exhausted seafarers, desperate to leave their ships and go home. Still, more than 400 seafarers remain trapped at the sea. The current situation is unsustainable. This cannot go on. Seafarers from all nationalities must be classified as key workers and be allowed to leave ships. And their replacement must be able to join those ships to start their work. I'm sure that all of you agree that seafarers are crucial for the safe operation of ships and the protection of the fragile marine environment. Safe navigation, safe shipping, safe gas, maritime trade, which is vital to the world economy. IMO has worked with a broad cross-section of maritime industry organization to develop a set of protocols to ensure safe changeover for all ships' crews. These wide-ranging protocols contain recommendations to maritime administration and other relevant national authorities, such as health, customs, immigration, border control, seaport, and the civil aviation authorities. In addition, IMO's Maritime Safety Committee has adopted a resolution on recommended action to facilitate ship's crew change, access to medical care, and the seafarer travel during the COVID-19 pandemic at the recent extraordinary session of the committee in September. 
I believe this effort to provide robust base for concrete actions to facilitate crew changes. What we need now is the cooperation and the collaboration of IMO member states, but also maritime organizations and other relevant national authorities. And this is where I'm certain this series of regional webinars will be crucial. Here, you have the opportunity to consider practical implication of the protocols and the resolutions, to share best practices, initiatives that have worked in your region, to exchange views and to find new solutions. Communication is key, and this webinar series facilitates communication among a wide range of stakeholders. The crew change issue is a humanitarian crisis that has implications for all of us. Today, we must all ask ourselves, what will it take to resolve this crisis? We all need to work together. Action is needed now. We all depend on seafarers. They should not be the collateral victims in this pandemic. Seafarers deliver for us, and now we need to deliver for them. I thank you for your kind attention and wish you fruitful deliberations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary General. Uh, and I'd now like to invite uh, Mr. Brandt Wagner who is Head of Transport and Maritime Sector Unit from our sister organization, the International Labor Organization, to highlight some maritime labor issues and COVID-19. Mr. Wagner, please. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> and Secretary, Jim, Secretary General Lim, IMO colleagues and others, thank you for inviting the ILO to this event. It's very important. Um, as you know, ILO is a UN specialized agency uh, which aims for decent work for all and we are a tripartite organization where governments, ship owners, and seafarers organizations all have a voice and vote. Uh, when, uh, on, with respect to the uh, crisis, the most important instrument that sets out the protection of the rights of seafarers is the Maritime Labor Convention 2006 as amended, <clears throat> otherwise known as the MLC 2006, which has been ratified by now 97 states and about 20 in, in the Asia Pacific region. When the pandemic crisis broke out, ILO's constituents turned to the ILO Secretariat uh, for guidance on how to uh, deal with maritime labor issues, in particular, how to apply the MLC in the context of COVID. Uh, following consultations with the officers of the Special Tripartite Committee of the Maritime Labor Convention, uh, the ILO published an information note, and this is a very valuable source of information on ILO's views. Uh, which referred to the exceptional uh, nature of the situation, but also emphasized the obligations of states to comply with the MLC, uh, with uh, bearing in mind that we need to be pragmatic and also, uh, but we need to protect seafarers. Uh, that statement also called on governments uh, when they take actions to consult with ship owners and seafarers organizations, especially if they're looking into flexibility with respect to the MLC. It also uh, set out particular explanations and information on uh, how to deal with uh, certain issues like occupational safety and health, repatriation, hours of uh, work and rest, and of course, uh, the time you can spend on board. Uh, the ILO Secretariat also responded uh, to requests from indiv individual uh, states and also from shipowners and seafarer organizations to intervene with some governments who uh, did not appear to be fulfilling their obligations under the convention. Uh, for example, not allowing seafarers to have medical access, to access to medical care ashore. Uh, in July, we updated this information note because the crisis was no longer an unexpected event. We were, we're getting used to it and noted that every attempt should be made to comply with the provisions of the MLC, even if it's difficult or expensive to do so. Uh, and we also emphasize in that statement, and this is very important, that the maximum period that seafarers should remain on board 
is 11 months, a figure derived from the provisions of the convention. This figure has been used widely to press to get seafarers home. Uh, the ILO has been working, in terms of good practices, we've been working very closely with IMO, with ICS, ITF, all represented here in this crisis. Uh, we've been part of the uh, Maritime Coronavirus Strategy Group, which is led by ICS. And we've also been working with individual governments. Uh, Secretary, Lim, Secretary Lim, General Lim has, has, has been a great leader in this, as has been our own Director General, uh, Guy Ryder. And we've been working closely with the other UN agencies. But the rate of uh, crew changes continues to be too slow, obviously too slow. And this is due to restrictions on disembarkation in port, ports, uh, difficulties obtaining visas, lack of commercial flights, shortages of COVID test kits, and other problems. So what works, uh, for our, from our perspective, what works is, is first that we're making an approach, not only of course to maritime administrations and labor ministries, but to all government agencies. We're trying to get to the highest level to encourage them to work together on the crew change issue. Um, and what we've been doing lately uh, is to approach individual governments uh, together with IMO to understand where the problems are, to identify, you know, and once identifying those problems, trying to determine how to overcome them. So uh, there's a collective action here by the UN agency, but it also requires a collective action at the national level. And finally, um, the, uh, we've also really called out to others in the, uh, who are using shipping, for example, charters and others in the global supply chain using shipping to do their part. For example, we are calling on charters not to uh, take ships off charter when they're diverted to ports where crew changes can take place. So uh, we, we're now finally, final notice that we're in a situation now where we have, for example, from Tonga recently, a report of seafarers on board for 19 months, which is completely and absolutely un unsustainable. And it's inconsistent with the Maritime Labor Convention. So the crew change issue is no longer, as Secretary General Lim said, a maritime safety and economic issue, but also a uh, humanitarian crisis. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Brant Wagner from ILO, uh, particularly for highlighting the need for collective action at a national level to get a response. Uh, the, the maritime organizations, the maritime authorities are, are, are well aware of the problem, but a lot of the solutions clearly rest with other government departments, border controls, public health. <clears throat> and it's very important that we all and I mean all of us, the, the 240 participants in this conference, uh, as well as the speakers, get that message out there and promote that. Uh, just one other administration issue. This event is being recorded. <clears throat> the uh, presentations will be available afterwards on the website, uh, as will the references to documents such as uh, Maritime Neighbor Convention and the guidance uh, that Mr. Wagner referred to. Uh, I'd now like to call on Dr. Ninglan Wang from the World Health Organization to examine some of the issues of medical care of seafarers in the context of COVID-19. Dr. Wang, please. Um, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much for inviting WHO to this very important event. And uh, taking this opportunity, I would like to just to brief you all that some uh, development in terms of the travel related guidance and International House Regulation Emergency Committee. Uh, all this information related to international travel and transport to definitely the seafarer is a very important part of that. Uh, so next slide, please. Yes. Um, so WHO has published our uh, travel guidance on 30th of July, which is the public health considerations for resuming the international travel. And basically throughout the entire pandemic that any travel advice, advisory and public health consideration related to travel, there is a very consistent message, which is that essential travel should be prioritized for, for, for the government. So this is a message that we get across uh, every uh, travel related publications in our meetings. Uh, so in these documents, basically you can see that we outlined uh, the essential travel uh, categories, and these are the uh, recommendations for the government uh, for emergency humanitarian actions and then the essential travel, uh, uh, travel of essential personnel, including the transport sector such as seafarers and the cargo transport, 
all this should be um, prioritized for, for as an essential function. And of course, then too, we have to bear in mind that uh, the sick travelers and persons uh, at risk, including those uh, elderly and with uh, uh, underlying conditions, this need to uh, somehow uh, delay or avoid the traveling uh, when, if they're sick or at risk. So next slide, please. Um, lately, we have uh, the fifth International House Regulation Emergency Committees uh, for COVID-19, which was held on 29th of October. Uh, so this is the, uh, um, let's say, our International House Regulation mechanism that will provide the uh, public house recommendations uh, for our DG, for the virtual DG, and to, um, uh, in relation to the pandemic or the outbreak set of international concern. So during this uh, committee uh, meeting, and there was a recommendation, of course, there are a set of in, uh, recommendations in relation to every areas across uh, WHO's functions, technical functions. Uh, but the one related to travel, uh, there was a recommendation for WHO secretariat, which is to continue to work with the partners to update and uh, review the evidence-based guidance for international travel. And this guidance uh, should be focusing on risk-based approach and also the, the um, in consideration of transmission and classification of the countries and also their response capacities in the origin and destination countries. Uh, especially uh, in this pandemic, we know the testing capacity is very important and also the, the surveillance capacity to uh, early detect, uh, detect the cases and to trace the contacts and to isolate the cases to uh, quarantine the uh, contacts so on and so forth. So this is paramount uh, for countries to bring the uh, pandemic under control. And then of course, then the, for travel, uh, the other travel specific consideration is also very important to, for instance, the compliance of the travelers uh, uh, was the uh, preventive health measures, for instance, um, to, to keep the, the um, uh, physical distancing at least one meter as much as possible, uh, use of masks and also the um, respiratory hygiene, hand hygiene, and so on and so forth. So there is a preventive uh, package uh, for, for prevent yourself uh, from, uh, you know, getting sick from the others or uh, from transmitting to the others. And then for the countries, uh, the recommendation is that the countries need to constantly review their uh, measures in terms of international travel, and that including the border closure measures and any other measures that were uh, interfered with international uh, traffic. Uh, so this needs to be also all the measures that to put out by the governments, they need to consider whether this is risk-based, evidence-based, or whether they will cause unnecessary interference to the travel. So next uh, slide, please. Um, I would also all like to take this opportunity to stress on the importance again. I'm sorry. Um, sorry. So this is a, um, a message that actually uh, I've seen that have been uh, um, highlighted by our former speaker, that brand from ILO. I think that's the that's the message that we all wanted to uh, get across our uh, audience, which is that the multi-sectoral collaboration and uh, a joint joint platform. And so, in the international health regulations, we do have our uh, requirement for the government, which is for the points of entry. In our case, is ports that uh, each point of entry need to establish a uh, multi-sectoral uh, uh, public health emergency plan, which will uh, require a joint pl a platform for information sharing across different agencies along uh, within the ports and also the commands, the ships, and also the travelers. And you need to set up the, the arrangement for um, identify the cases, isolating the cases, treat, treating the cases and transport the cases and contacts to the healthcare facilities for further uh, assessment and the treatment. And all this information between the uh, points of entry uh, and convenience and the hospitals and healthcare facilities and public health uh, uh, surveillance and response system, this has to be a loop. So in this case, the government can have our, a proper risk assessment in terms of the, whether there was imported cases, what's the impact of these imported cases on their country. And for all this information eventually will be 
uh, conveyed to WHO through the National Focal Point um, Network. And this is a 24 seven uh, sort of uh, a functioning uh, mechanism. And, and regardless of our breaks, there's uh, always the, the message that from WHO that essential supply chain should be kept. And also the seafarers are the end, also the crew, they are the key workers to ensure that supply chain uh, are fully functioning. So uh, next slide, please. Um, the last but not the least, I would like to also speak a few words on the guidance that we have published, which was developed in collaboration with IMO, ILO, and ICS, and other uh, shipping industries, which uh, really uh, contribute a lot to, to the um, uh, development process. Uh, the guidance uh, stress on the, uh, uh, how to promote the public health measures in response to COVID-19 on cargo ships and fishing vessels. So basically, it uh, uh, covers the continuum of travel, pre-boarding, uh, boarding and post arrival. So how seafarers can prevent themselves from being contacted and from also, uh, um, you know, transmission, uh, become the transmission uh, source of the others. So uh, this guidance is very, uh, has a wider uh, scope, which includes the mental health issue as well. And in meanwhile, uh, couple, coupling with this guidance, we are also finalizing a learning um, uh, program, which is very interactive. And we will be sharing that with our uh, our partners in IMO, ILO, and ICS and so on. So um, the seafarers can use this platform, use this training program and to, you know, to be more interactive and somehow could also simulate the, um, some scenarios that they might encounter in their day-to-day -day, uh, work. Um, so I think that's all from my side and uh, we're very happy to, to um, answer the questions later on. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wang, for a very comprehensive uh, overview. And thank you very much also for the references that we'll make available uh, after the event. You've, you've highlighted the need for effective risk-based and coherent approaches. Uh, you've also highlighted the need for compliance by travelers and crews, uh, a very important part of the, the equation, uh, and the need for a multi-sectoral approach, which leads me neatly into the next session, uh, IMO, of course, practices what it preaches. So we have a multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary approach uh, to this issue through the Seafarers Crisis Action Team. Uh, and I'd like to invite my friend and colleague, Ismail Cabos Delgado, uh, head of Marine Training and Human Element uh, within Maritime Safety Division uh, to give us an overview of that. Uh, thank you very Ismail, much. It's all yours. Thank you very much, Chris, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today. I think it's a relevant event. All these series of events uh, should contribute to, to try and, and fix some of the problems that we are facing today. So yeah, uh, this is basically the framework um, of IMO, which is embedded in its convention. And this, this is the framework within which we are now taking action to, to try and, and counteract some of the consequences of this pandemic. So next slide, please. Here we have um, an overview of the CFIS situation during the pandemic. Uh, we have the crew change overview. This is, uh, in theory, what um, we are facing. So out of 112 countries surveyed by um, Waterfront, which is a, a maritime services uh, company, 69 are allowing crew changes. And uh, as I said, this is the theory because when you go to the uh, right uh, hand side graph, you see the crew change achievements, indicating that uh, several hundreds of thousands of seafarers are still uh, stranded on board ships, not able to go back home. Next, please. So with regards to uh, the role of IMO and actions uh, taken during the pandemic, um, and in particular in relation to IMO's action and together with other UN uh, specialized agencies, uh, I can emphasize that mindful of the serious impact of travel restrictions on interna international traffic and trade, and also the difficulties um, of CFRS crew change and access to medical care, specialized agencies have taken countless um, relevant actions in an attempt to address these and other serious issues arising during the, the, the crisis. And in particular, this has been done through the promulgation of a comprehensive set of recommendations and guidance. 
and this has been coordinated by several international organizations, relevant authorities, and of course, global maritime industry associations. And this has been all promulgated uh, through circular letters uh, 4204 and addenda. As part of these provisions, governments and relevant authorities have been strongly urged to establish a coordinated, proactive and pragmatic approach to ensure the integrity and continued facilitation of the global supply chain. They have also been recommended to designate professional seafarers and marine personnel as key workers in order to grant them any necessary and uh, appropriate exemptions from uh, national travel or movement restrictions in order to facilitate their joining or leaving ships and in order to provide emergency medical care ashore. Governments have also been encouraged to uh, take a pragmatic and practical approach with regard to the extension of an acceptance of CFR certificates, including medical certificates and endorsements. Next, please. Uh, yeah, with regard to the CFR crisis action team, um, the IMO Secretary General in his determination to support the global supply chain in general and CFRS in particular established the CFRS Crisis Action Team back in April. Um, this is a team established within the Secretariat uh, to cooperate with global industry groups to take action as well through diplomatic channels and intervene in specific cases regarding crew change, repatriation, access to medical care and abandonment as an this was in, in, in principle an additional driving force to protect our seafarers and address trade disruptions. Well, as you can imagine, this thing has been exceedingly busy during the last months and has successfully contributed to the resolution of many individual cases. Just as a piece of information, we have been dealing with more than 300 cases, which individual, individually represent a much higher number of cases and many of them have been uh, successfully resolved. With regard to the to IMO's cooperation with the shipping industry, um, yeah, uh, from the early stages of the outbreak of the pandemic, the IMO Secretariat has been in continuous cooperation and consultation with the shipping industry in general, and IGOs and NGOs in consultative status with IMO in particular. Relevant guidance um, has been disseminated by means of the aforementioned IMO circular letters that was 4204 series in order to ensure global distribution in the maritime sector and beyond. Several UN specialized energy uh, agencies, including IMO, WHO and ILO, actively participate, as uh, Brand said before, in the weekly meetings um, of the ICS-led Corona Strategy Group which is also composed of a large number uh, of shipping industry associations. The group has developed a wide variety of uh, recommendations addressing issues such as um, crew welfare, facilitation of crew changes, guidance on the use of uh, personal protective equipment and abandonment of seafarers to, to name just a few. Next, please. Um, in relation to the recent and ongoing uh, work of IMO, um, Actions that have been promoted within the UN framework include adoption um, of the maritime safety by the Maritime Safety Committee, sorry, of um, the resolution mentioned by the Secretary General in his introduction. Uh, this is MSC 473 um, on recommended action to facilitate ship crew change, access to medical care, and CFR travel during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is calling govern on governments to put in place response to the humanitarian and safety crisis faced by seafarers as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. It should also help uh, to ensure the integrity of employment and human rights of seafarers and consequentially minimize disruptions of global trade. Finally, I would like to emphasize that uh, MSC 102, which is going to be um, uh, holding uh, its meeting during this week and next week, will consider COVID-related proposals and in particular, a proposal to recognize the recommended fra framework of protocols related to safe uh, ship crew changes led by the industry, as provided in, in, in the circular series that I mentioned before. So uh, what is proposed is that uh, MSC approves an MSC circular uh, promulgating this uh, framework, framework of protocols and keeping them up to date. Uh, there is also a proposal to develop a new GISIS model to register ports that facilitate crew changes and disseminate information provided by member states about those ports to enable 
shipping companies to easily plan and organize crew changes during the COVID-19 pandemic. There are some other proposals submitted to MSC 102, such as one to develop a universal non-text logo that en enables, in theory, this is the idea, CFRS to uh, identify and access dedicated resources and processes. So finally, uh, um, please rest assured that IMO's coordinated action at the UN level with member states and the industry continues and will continue until we overcome this crisis altogether. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ismail, for that very comprehensive overview. Uh, the guidance that you've referred to will be made available or, or is available on the IMO website, and we really look forward to uh, the outputs of MSC 102, which actually starts today uh, on this very, very important issue. Now, this webinar is focused on uh, Asia-Pacific region. Uh, you will hear a number of very uh, distinguished and expert speakers talking tomorrow about what's actually being done. But to give us an overview, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Azar uh, Jamazina, who is the Chief Transport Connectivity and Logistics Section uh, for UNSCAP uh, in Asia Pacific, to highlight the impact of COVID-19 on sustainable maritime transport and trade in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, and Jamazina, you have the floor. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear colleagues, uh, for this invitation. And indeed, uh, UNSCAP, the, uh, which is the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, we are the UN regional body uh, for um, uh, the many, many countries in Asia and Pacific. And on the maritime affairs, we work very closely with the IMO. And just last week, we had His Excellency Secretary General Liam at our opening, our closing our Ocean Day discussion. So I'm very pleased to be here and support in turn this uh, valuable initiative by the IMO and other colleagues present here to highlight the challenges faced by seafarers. Um, I'm, next slide, please. Yes, my 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 presentation or perspective is slightly different because you we, we you spoke a bit more concretely about seafarers, but we would like to make the bridge. Why should our countries care, and why they uh, you know it should not just a social issue, please stand up, but an economic issue as well. You know that Asian Pacific, where the driving force of world economy, the maritime trade. Um, we have a big chunk of it, a big, large, 60, uh, more than 60% uh, part of that pie that is in Asia and the Pacific. We have leaders in maritime connectivity in our region, traditional established leaders, but also newcomers and new countries, particularly in Southeast Asia, becoming um, great uh, actors in, in the field. And relevant to this discussion, we are major suppliers of seafarers. We have our countries, members of UNESCO, China, Philipp the Philippines, Indonesia, Russian Federation, they supply uh, um, a large part of uh, labor force. And of course, in our region, we have countries with special needs. I know this is focused in Indonesia, but we have an issue of uh, countries in the Pacific who are, who are not uh, connected very well to the rest of the global economy. And, and, and this is a, a very pressing concern for my region. Next slide, please. So, so when we when we looked at the impact of maritime connectivity, well, we looked, what I think we've accomplished is to raise the issue of sustainable maritime connectivity as part of the COVID-19 response and, and encourage the governments in Asia and the Pacific to look at, uh, at the various impacts of COVID-19 on shipping due to the disruptions in the land-based global supply chains and production activity, but also the uh, problem, problem of hinterland, collection, hinterland connection of the ports, um, the contraction in the demand, uh, many other and operational connectivity issues that COVID-19 response has imposed on the transport sector. Uh, and this is something I think that was quite uh, successful. Our countries are very much aware of how maritime transport and COVID uh, in Asia Pacific are very much interrelated and how response to COVID-19 means quite a few concrete actions in the maritime area. Next slide, please. What we have done together with our countries is a bit of on a smaller scale, but IMO colleagues have done. We've looked at what the countries have done uh, in the maritime sector during the COVID, uh, the, since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. And on, on one hand, we were pleased with the resp response and the rapid 
um, response of our countries and their commitment to, uh, to keep uh, their ports open. We've seen that the maritime connectivity, with some exceptions, has remained quite um, uh, preserved, as, as it were, and our ports really uh, show the resilience uh, and, and uh, heart uh, you know, very, very strong response, very, very great commitment to keeping the economies, uh, the global economy, but also the national economies and supply of critical goods uh, open. So all countries in our region that we've surveyed, surveyed had maintained their ports open for freight and they've taken many measures and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir, you know what those are. Uh, but what we've seen mostly afterwards as a sort of part, uh, a bit uh, darker part of the picture is the toll that it has taken on some key personnel and I think crew uh, crew members and seafarers are an ex excellent uh, illustration of that. So it came at, the, at this great cost uh, to the human element of maritime connectivity. Next slide, please. Uh, we are quite concerned that any kind of shortages and any impact on the global services of maritime will not just affect the countries directly, you know, supplier, um, the buyer and the, and the supplier, but all the countries in the midst, in particular, are least connected countries in Asia, uh, in the Pacific, that that will uh, that are already suffering because some of the Colleagues, my apologies, I was suddenly kicked out of Zoom. Uh, I hope we're back on, and apologies for this technical hiccup. Dear colleagues, it seems that we've all been uh, taken out of the meeting inadvertently, so uh, bear with us uh, for a couple of seconds. Uh, sincere apologies for that. Uh, if you'd like to carry on, please. Yes, thank you very much. I was nearing five uh, minutes and I thought you found a very good way of uh, helping speakers manage their, t manage their time. Um, so no, no worries. Uh, let me just uh, uh, recall the, the last point that I was making, uh, that we are afraid of any disruptions that caused by shortage of personnel. Uh, it will not be affecting just the, the seafarers themselves. It will affect the economy of our region and it, it will leave some of the more vulnerable uh, actors in our region um, at the margin of the global economy. Next slide, please. So colleagues, um, I would like to uh, conclude by saying that perhaps one of the, the, the mandate of UNSCAP, uh, the we are Economic and Social Commission, we look when we work on maritime connectivity as, as such, and, and largely it was dominated by the economic aspects and how it helps our economies grow. So naturally, when we have looked at the ways um, the COVID-19 has impacted maritime connectivity, we looked and identified short and long-time structural changes, some of them uh, with higher vulnerabilities, but some of them quite positive, greater digitalization, greater use of technology, greater resilience in the future. But what this seminar webinar and, and the work of AMO and ILO and other colleagues have shown us that what this COVID-19 pandemic has done is also said that you cannot have resilient maritime connectivity if you do not protect um, and in, enhance the treatment of your transport workers. So we will make sure from our side to make sure uh, we, to incorporate the, the social issues and the issues of seafarers and in particular reference to very concrete work that's done by the organizations present here in our regional cooperation framework on maritime transport, the next regional action program for Asia and the Pacific on transport connectivity. In that sense, I hope that that could be the contribution that UNESCO can make to uh, address this very important issue. I will fi finish on that and thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh brief uh, but regrettably interrupted overview. I do like your style as a way of cutting off uh, speakers, but uh, I think I better give that a miss. Uh, thank you very much for highlighting the fact that sustainable maritime transport is essential to the global economy uh, and it's also essential to the post-COVID recovery as well, uh, and also the need to protect transport workers. So moving on from that, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Natalie Shaw, uh, who is from the International Chamber of Shipping uh, to look at 
or to, to cover why our seafarers' needs appearing to be forgotten during the pandemic. Uh, Natalie, you have the floor, please. Okay, uh, we appear to have a slight technical hitch on uh, Natalie Shaw, but I hope we'll get her back for you. In the meantime, if I could invite uh, Mr. Branko Berlan from the International Transport Workers Federation, uh, their representative at IMO, to uh, talk about COVID-19 beyond the limit, please. Uh, Branko, you have the floor. Th thank you, Chair. You hear me? I also have some technical issues I did before, now it's okay. And Thank the IMO for organizing this very important webinar in regard to these. Uh, I will focus my presentation in regard to the to the crew change. So and thank Secretary General for very kind words uh, at the opening of this session. As many already said, it is estimated that around 400,000 seafarers has exceed their contractual tours of duty by months. At the same time, scheduled renewal of certificates for the ship's worthiness uh, of ship continuing being validated by remote inspection why cycles maintenance in shipyards has been postponed indefinitely in some case. But these are not the only issues that COVID-19 brought on surface, which have to be facilitated and solved. The issue of the extension of the CFA certificates, safe manning, and also rest are crucial. Also the question of the remote inspections and computer-based training or e-learning on ships. All of those and them with, with an impossibility for a crew change put the situations beyond the limits. However, I'm not going to specially elaborate on this today, as it believe as I believe we all need a thorough inter internal discussion and then at least a specialized webinar, at least on each of them. Let's be clear and frank: this remains a huge problem, and now today we could easily say that about a half a million frustrated and tired. Seafarers are trapped on board. Their ships within waiting uh, to return home. At the same time, an equal number of seafarers waiting to board within no possibility to bring money to their families. That presents about 75% of the active seafarers. So we're talking about 1 million people in emergency need. And, then in, and that, in a way, really becoming a matter of humanity. Going back to the crew change, which is pre-required issues to be solved. In the last several months, a number of governments has committed, have committed during various public international events to favorable consider the efforts of the maritime industry, United Nations, and the special agencies, global retired suppliers, political parties, and financial institutions to ensure crew change can safely take place. The aim was to avoid the interruption of the global supply chain, the increasing risk of maritime accident and environmental disaster, as well as a fatigue and stress among the seafarers. The practical steps suggested by the maritime industry to protect seafarers and the population in the countries where seafarers are supposed to join or leave ship were developed, taking into account authoritative health advice and technical operational requirements. This result in a set of documents and detailed protocols adopted by the International Maritime Organization that are fit for a purpose and aiding governments to effect crew change. However, the commitment undertaken by the key governments, which either present the, facilit uh, the facilities of the effect crew change to provide a large number of seafarers to the global fleet, were frustrated by, first of all, uh, inability to effectively coordinate national government agencies and ministers a lack of understanding of how the global supply change is supported by shipping, 
the reduction of commercial flights, the inability to adjust travel restrictions in coordinated manner, including the provision of visa to facilitate the transit of bona fide CFAs for the purpose of the joining or leaving ships, a lack of consultation with the maritime social partners, and at the end, ships continue to sail even with the associated risk. Supplying the world community has not incentivized a promo and prompt reaction. However, the ITF would like to propose a short-term step forward. Uh, as it is now, and as some governments for maritime trade, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> Uh, have committed to give effect of the demands of the CFAS passage for a uh, safe passage for CFAS and collaborate with the industry and social partners on the uh, building the solution. It's appeared that the next step should be to concentrate effort on affecting crew change in the key countries. In the key countries, the political commitment made by key maritime governments, aid by technical political and financial support to cohesively implement protocols and practical steps could be the silver lining to support the maritime industry and the world CFAS. The effort will benefit from the successful attempt to draw international attention to the issue and lesson learned from the best practices. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, I'm Morgan. Thank you. Thank you, Branko, for that uh, excellent summary of, of COVID-19 beyond the limit and the fact that half a million seafarer, up to half a million seafarers are suffering uh, badly from the situation. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Captain Kuba Szymanski from the uh, Secretary General of Intermanager to continue the theme, uh, looking at seafarers very much human beings. Uh, Kuba, the floor is yours. Thank you and good morning everyone. I'm just waiting for my slides to start. I'm very well aware of the nine minutes we are left and thousands of questions we have uh, received and I think we would like to answer those questions as well. Intermanager, we are the Ship and Crew Management Association International and what we have done in order to facilitate is pulling resources. Next slide please. And the whole idea is that we can help each other. You probably saw this slide already today. What I wanted to highlight is that blue line is what members of Intermanager are doing. That's not saying that the whole industry. We are only 30, it might be 35% of the industry as the ship managers, and that's what is shown on the blue. So if you were to multiply that by, by, that by three, you will probably get to close to something like 400, 500,000 seafarers being replaced. And that is extremely important because if you were listening to previous uh, speakers, you would understand that ship management, crew management are those guys with hands in grease, shopping floor guys. This is what happens. We are doing crew changes, despite the fact that 40 countries are not allowing us to do that. So imagine with unbelievable uh, problems, our guys, ship managers, crew managers, are finding ways to do the crew changes. I was delighted last week to receive messages from our members saying that they caught up with backlog created on the 27th of March. We are back to square one where we were with crew changes. We've got no people overdue. That is staggering in comparison to what we are hearing as well. So message from us is you can do it. Yes, despite the fact that some countries in Asia are throwing spanners and doing everything for us not to be able to do that. But we find other countries, and those countries are Japan. Thank you, Japan. Germany, although it's not Asia, but I need to mention Germany. I need to mention Holland and UK. These countries are the leaders, and we can take the best practice from those countries. If we look in Asia, I don't want to name because it would be name and shame but not mentioning those countries should actually send the message. Next slide, please. Okay, many people before me spoke, then we are cooperating. And right from the beginning, these organizations got together and prepare things. Next slide. We did prepare the recommendation and framework. Next slide. Very good plan, excellent plan, which was consulted by 
many governments. So we do know what to do. So countries which are now saying then they, they are actually coming up with their own plans. Why they didn't come when we were creating plan? Why they are throwing spanners again? This is intertanko, bear in mind, we are not, we are intermanager, but because we are cooperating, we are pulling resources in order to make a crew change happen. So I'm asking countries in Asia to cooperate, to work together with us, not to go separate ways, because that doesn't help. If we've got seafarers, that means we've got ships. If we've got ships, that means we've got medicine, we've got fuel. You cannot be without us. Like you cannot be without doctors and firefighters. There is very good reason why seafarers are called key workers, because they do supply your doctors with needed supplies. So allow us to crew change as well. I wanted to highlight what Branko already said. We can, cannot forget about people who are waiting at home. These guys want to go and relieve their colleagues at sea. So it's not only 400,000 we are talking about, it's closer to 1 million. People who need to go back. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, thank you. This is an example of our message to members where we are pulling resources, we are helping each other, we are trying to show the best ways. If you were to go to our website and you don't have to be a member, just have a look, go to the Maritime Champions Club and you will see countries, ports, where the crew changes are actually physically happening. Again, you will be staggered not to see some countries which before COVID were calling themselves leaders in shipping. Where are these leaders nowadays? Where are those countries which were supposed to help and assist seafarers? Why they have forgotten about those human beings? I'm asking you a question. There will be answers tomorrow, no doubt. They will be with us. Next slide, please. That's me done. Thank you. I'm waiting for questions. Over to you. Thank you very much, Secretary General, for that uh, very strong uh, message, uh, particularly on the need to see what Japan, Germany, Holland and UK are doing as best practice and how to share and distill that to make sure it's uh, put everywhere uh, and the need for uh, cooperation in Asia as well. Uh, I understand we, we don't have uh, Natalie Shaw uh, back with us. Uh, but she's tr currently trying to connect. So in the meantime, uh, we did, before the break, uh, receive a question relating to the conflict between national law and local practices uh, being a, 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 a block on seafarer uh, repatriation. Uh, I'd like to throw it open to any of the members of the panel uh, to say how we're going to address that. And I also invite the audience to submit any further questions. I think given the fact that we've had a bit of a break, uh, we can extend the session by a few minutes. So please carry on. Branko, please. Uh, Cuba, please. Uh, yes, please. Go ahead. Well, seeing silence here, I will chip in, obviously. And <laughs> I think uh, it would be very good if we could ask all ourselves to promote shipping even further than we have been doing so far. We definitely need a good message to go to the general public so they can see that many, many industries they were familiar with collapsed. They are not doing as well. And we need to tell them, but we are here, guys. We are here despite our own problems. We are talking within the family about our issues. But as far as general public is concerned, the bread is on the table. The fuel is at the pump. The medicine is in the hospital. That's only because shipping industry does not come with the ideas like air industry, train industry, whatever you call it, okay? We are there. We were prepared. We were able to quickly recap the situation, find solutions and deliver. If we could get this message across to Joe Bloke in any country, then I think governments, politicians in every local uh, constituency would have a problem to throw a spanner, to object to seafarers, because the regular people will say, hold on a second, allow these guys to come. They need to join the ship. They need to go home. 
because they are actually delivering goods on our tables. Thank you. Thank you very much. To... Okay. Okay. Uh, I understand that we, we can't get uh, Natalie Shaw to connect. Does anybody, any other panelists wish to comment on that particular question or raise any questions of their own? Uh, see. Brian, go ahead, please. Yeah, I mean, this is a quick one. I mean, we've been pushing constantly for coordination among the U.S. agencies and constantly for coordination among the national agencies at the national level. But this sort of ports, points out the importance of bringing in all the local authorities into that coordination mechanism at the national level as well. And I don't know how that's being done. Maybe somebody can ex explain how they're doing it in a particular country. But it seems if the even if we work things out at the national level in a specific country, but there's not a lot of consultation with the local authorities, they may be, they, the message may not even get to them clearly. We heard early on in the crisis that there were a lot of were acting almost independently. So I guess they have to be part of that debate in order to um, in order to come up with solutions. Great. Well, thank you very much. I th I think some of the messages coming through here very loud and clear is that need for us us the the nearly 300 people on this uh on this event to scream loud the importance of shipping the importance of seafarers being treated as key workers the need for coordination at national level there's also a need to identify best practice uh you've just brunt's just challenged people to say what's happening in your countries what's going right please don't hesitate to let us know that now in terms of tomorrow in terms of uh, tomorrow's program uh, we're going to be drilling down into the the regional approach we're going to be looking at what india is doing what the philippines is doing what china is doing indonesia and singapore so hopefully they will bring some good uh, information on what's happening that we can share with other member states. But if you're from Asia, anywhere in Asia Pacific or anywhere in the world and you you know about it, matters that are actually working, procedures that are working, please let us know so we can do our communication function and share that. Unless anybody has any other questions? You want to say something? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, only to emphasize, uh, the our proposal is actually what uh, you and Cuba said. It's 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 about the key countries and governments and the problems they still have, but we should find the best practice and to learn from the from these yeah. what is going on. And I think that is the best way. It's not a, a to blame and shame. But it's just to say it, please check it, find out the solutions that many other governments have it. Although those who did make uh, some kind of the commitment that they will do it, they still have a problem. But we could easily go to the, to the issues and find the solutions. Otherwise, it will never happen. You know, the, it's called now a, a new wave is coming. And uh, many of these things are back to the, in, in regard to the COVID. So let's be honest and have it clearly saying, yes, this is a huge problem and we can't accept these situations any longer. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Well, as I say, tomorrow we will be looking at the, uh, the situation on the ground in Asia Pacific. Uh, I would encourage all of our participants to think about questions, come up with questions for tomorrow. Uh, and if you've got things to say or information to provide, uh, please do so. On that note, I think we'll stand by. Sorry. Yeah, we will. Thank you. Uh, we will also invite uh, ICS to speak uh, in tomorrow's session so we don't miss out their important message. So on that happy note, I'd like to thank you all very, very much. <laughs>